Even in darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. Good morning. Thank you for joining us once again here at First Baptist Troy, and we are so glad that you've come to worship with us this morning. And if you are new to our church, if this is the first time that you've tuned in with us, we're so thrilled that you've joined us for worship today, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, We would greatly appreciate you taking a moment maybe to reach out to us by calling the church office or maybe sending us a note. You can go to our church website and on our contact page, you can find a way to do that there. We would love to hear from you and love to have an opportunity to connect with you and to help you find ways to get better connected here at First Baptist Troy. And each and every week, I know the majority of you that are watching today 
our, our regulars with us, and we hope and pray that these services have been an encouragement to you. And we want, I want to mention just a couple of things to you by way of a reminder and also some announcements. Uh, next Sunday on the 16th will actually be our first Sunday back uh, in Sunday school. Some of you that have been tuning in may be planning to come back to your Sunday school class. Please check the church website, and also you may have received an email this past week with some information about our plans to do that, and also the different safety protocols and different things that we are continuing to do here to prepare for that day. So please go and read that information. There's also a video that's been uh, put out about that as well, and so we encourage you to go do that. And also, uh, we will have our normal schedule will be at 9 o'clock Sunday school, and then 1015, and we'll have one service back here in the sanctuary. And uh, so we hope to plan and see you there if, you, uh, if you're planning to come be with us. Today, however, is College Sunday, and we're excited uh, to receive many of our college students who are back uh, at Troy University here in town, and also some of their families that will be joining us here in the sanctuary uh, today. And so we are so thrilled that, uh, that they're coming to do that. And Grant Norris, our college pastor, is going to be preaching this morning, so be in prayer for him as he brings God's Word to us. And uh, now if we'll take just a moment now to pray, and then following my prayer, uh, if we'll take just a moment, there'll be a video that we're going to be watching together that explains a little bit more about what's going to be happening uh, with our college ministry coming up this fall. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful time and the opportunity again to worship together. We pray, Lord, for your spirit to continue to minister to us. Lord, as we celebrate your grace in our lives and as we celebrate your love for us and your greatness, God, we worship you together. We confess our sins, Lord, before you. Lord, we know where we have failed. And we ask, God, that you would forgive us and cleanse us. And we pray for the gift of your Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and within us as we continue to pray and to seek you. And as we open our minds and hearts up to your word now and throughout the service. Lord, we also want to pray for our college ministry, Lord, for Grant and his leadership, but also our college students that are with us now and for their families. And we pray, God, on this day, Lord, that there will be many that will be encouraged through your word. And Lord, as the college ministry goes forward throughout this fall, Lord, we pray for your blessing upon all the efforts of bringing discipleship and different uh, ministry efforts, God, to help minister to those needs uh, and to connect students to you and to one another, Lord, for your glory. So, Lord, we give this time to you now, and we pray your blessings on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, my name is Grant Norris, and I am the college pastor here at First Baptist Church of Troy, and this is my wife, Birdie Norris. Hey, y'all. We're so thankful that you have joined us this Sunday. Um, for our students who are coming back to Troy, welcome back. We've missed y'all. And for all of our new students, thank you so much for um, spending today with us. Um, this video kind of is just going to take you into a few of the areas where um, we spend time with our college students. So um, there's three major ways to get involved in our college ministry. One is through our college worship nights, which is College Street. Um, two is through community groups. And three is through discipleship. So we're going to have a few of our students take a few moments to talk about that and tell you their experiences with these three different areas. Hey guys, what's up? It's Hunter. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what College Street is. College Street is going to be a super fun, relaxed environment where if you want to come worship with us, then please do. Um, we're going to meet every other Wednesday. We're going to have a message and we're going to have a time of worship. And following that, we're going to have some fellowship and just time to just talk and just get to know each other a little bit more. Um, if you want to bring a friend, just come on down and we'll have a great time at 7 o'clock. See you there. Welcome back, Troy students. My name is Nicholas Christen. I'm a fifth year senior here at Troy, and we are looking forward to starting back community groups here at FBC. Uh, starting the Monday, the 17th after school starts, we are gonna have community groups. If you don't know what a community group is, it's a small group of other college students, and we meet at different locations throughout the week at a local church member's home and we just study the Bible and usually they do cook dinner for you so you can look forward to that as well. Things I've enjoyed from my community group is getting to know everybody on a deeper level, uh, diving into the Bible every week with uh, people I enjoy to be around and also uh, I get to take my mind off of schoolwork for a couple hours each week and just focus on uh, the more important things. We look forward to meeting y'all. We will have community groups on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Signups will be in the back after the service and also um, after College Street on Wednesday nights. So one of the ways to kind of get involved um, at First Baptist and, and a great way to grow spiritually um, is discipleship. 
So coming into college, I really had no idea what discipleship was, um, but I, I soon learned whenever older believers kind of reached out to me and um, kind of encouraged me to, to invest in myself in this way. So really what discipleship is, um, it's a, a more in-depth uh, way to grow spiritually than more in-depth than like a small group or a Bible study. Um, and really the, what it looks like um, is an older believer leading younger believers, um, teaching them how to read the word, teaching them how to walk with the Lord and, and how to love the, wor uh, the Lord, how to struggle against sin, um, and really doing life with them. So got involved with discipleship like early on in college um, and I've been discipled by a few different people and um, I've just really seen so much fruit from being led like really intimately by older and wiser um, believers who show me how um, just to be a believer in college and so that's a, a really really great way I think a to get involved with uh, just the body of believers in First Baptist and also um, to grow spiritually. So this is really for people who are willing to make a commitment, um, who are willing to invest in their own walk with the Lord, um, because it, it does look like more of a commitment than something like a small group or a Bible study. You'll we meet weekly um, with your discipleship group and you'll go through a curriculum that First Baptist has um, that'll really teach you the ins and the outs of um, the church, of what a relationship with the Lord looks like and, and really what the gospel is um, on a deeper level. So this is something that I personally have grown so much from um, and I've seen the fruit of this in believers' lives around me. So if you are interested in discipleship um, and are willing to make that commitment, then how do you get involved? So um, I'd say reach out to people like Grant, uh, reach out to Birdie, reach out to me, um, members of the church, um, and they will kind of plug you into a discipleship group, get you um, connected with someone who can lead you in this way. So once again, we'd like to thank you for checking us out here at First Baptist Church of Troy. And so I think one of the, the biggest regrets that both Bertie and I had while we were at college is that we wish we had gotten more plugged into a local church. And so that, that's our challenge to you today is that uh, you're going to have so many commitments thrown at you during your time at Troy, but uh, we just want to challenge you to make the commitment to a local church in Troy. It doesn't have to be us. We'd love for it to be us, but there's also other great options too. But uh, once again, thank you so much for checking us out and hope you enjoy the service today.
that sealed the promise, your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise.
Calvary There stands an endless mercy tree Every broken, weary soul Find your rest and be made whole Stripes of blood that stain its prey Shed to wash away our shame From the scars pure love release Salvation by the mercy tree In the sky between two thieves Hung the blameless Prince of Peace Bruised and battered, scarred and scorned Sacred head pierced by our thorns It is finished, what's his cry? When dark that violent day, the whole earth quaked and love's display. Three days silent in the ground, his body born for heaven's crown. Yeah.
Well, good morning. Welcome back to First Baptist Church of Troy. Uh, if you're watching from home, thank you so much for tuning in with us. And so we're actually having our college Sunday here at the sanctuary. And so we're going to have two separate services and uh, just a great time to have college students back. And so today our text is going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 29. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 29. And uh, while you're turning there, I've just been thinking about uh, the anticipation of students coming back, thinking about my time in Troy. And one story that just stuck out to me was a time where um, I had such good memories of going home to get really good home-cooked meals. And so I lived two hours away from Troy when I was a student here. So many weekends I'd go with an empty belly, and uh, two to three months worth of laundry in the back seat of my car for my mom to do. And so uh, one of those trips had a great time, and I had a friend tell me, you know, you don't have to take that two-hour long trip to get back to Troy. There's an hour and 30-minute way. All you got to do is take this county road, take a left at this church sign, go straight, take one more right, and you're in Troy. And I thought, you know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. I think I'm going to take that path. The only problem was I did take that path. It was all country roads. My phone died, so I had no GPS, and the instructions started to get a little fuzzy to me. And so luckily for me, or what I thought was luck, is I saw another car with a Troy decal on it. I said, thank goodness. I'll just follow this person, and I'll probably end up in Troy. Well, concern drew when 30 minutes later, This car is taking lefts and rights all over the place, and then I see they turn off to the side of the road. They were just as lost as I was. So I begin to panic. I think, this is is where I'm going to die. I'm going to die amidst the pine trees in rural Alabama. But it took me hours to just going in circles to finally find my old truth path that led me back to Troy, that led me back home. And so I say all this today Because I think our text and what we're going to read today really hits home this story in a spiritual lens that maybe you who are watching today thinks you know a shortcut of how to get to heaven. Maybe you think there are more roads and religions that will get you there. And then Jesus is going to hit us with a huge truth bomb. And so would you read with me Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 28. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are a few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So this is the word of the Lord. This is Jesus' final words in his infamous sermon on the mount. Now, before the pandemic happened, we were going through a sermon series on College Street about the Sermon on the Mount. 
And so today I want to speak on the last bit of this sermon because it's not just an end of the sermon, but it's a call to something new, a call to something greater. But for us to really understand the picture of what Jesus is painting, I think it's really important that we go back to chapters 5 to where the Sermon on the Mount began. So Jesus came to establish this kingdom. It was heaven on earth. It turned everything upside down of what we thought religion was to be. And in chapters 5, he starts saying that the people of this kingdom will look radically different compared to a lost world. He starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the people who do this. And how rare is it to see people who are actually listed as these things from the Beatitudes? Where are these desperate people spiritually? Just someone who's vulnerable enough to know that he needs help. Where are the gentle people who are filled with mercy and grace with one another? Where are the peacemakers? Where are the peacemakers in our politics today? Where are any of these people? I'm afraid that they are becoming fewer and far between. But these are the people of Christ's kingdom. And for us watching today, I wonder for us, are are we actually good representations of his kingdom? Do we match these lists of beatitudes? Moving on into his sermon too, Jesus uh, explains the law a little bit better to us. He said, I didn't come here to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And so it's important. So we need to keep these commands. But although we keep these commands, don't you dare try to think that following these rules will earn your salvation. The the requirement is perfection of the law. And so Jesus is going to dismantle pretty quick when he says, oh, you think think you're a good person because you don't murder. Well, I'll say, even if you're angry, you commit murder in your heart. You think you're a pretty good person because you don't cheat on your spouse. Well, I'll say, if you just have a lustful thought, you've already committed adultery of the heart. You think you're a morally good person to the guy sitting beside you? Your righteousness doesn't have to match the Pharisees. It has to exceed the Pharisees. So Jesus is just dropping the mic and telling us that uh, we can't live our lives in moral perfection. Therefore, don't try to find your value towards me according to moral perfection. So Jesus shows in the sermon, our hearts, we still want to trust in our own righteousness. But before we can really even function as kingdom citizens, we have to trust in what the king has already done for us. And so near the end of the sermon, Jesus goes on and just starts spilling out kingdom life on this earth. He, he teaches us how to give generously. We heard uh, Pastor Ross preach on this last week. He teaches us how to pray and stop trying to use impressive words, but pray like you would go to a good and loving father tells us not to worry about anything because God cares about what the birds are being fed. Don't you know he cares about you more than he does a bird? He tells us not to judge from a self-righteous heart, but judge that according, excuse me, judge someone in accordance that the gospel may save you from destruction. And he also hits on the golden rule and how we should treat one another. And so here we find ourselves in the sermon now, And it's a huge and it's a crucial point. It's the climax of the sermon. No longer is he merely just describing kingdom life and teaching ways of his kingdom, but he demands a decision out of you and out of me. And it's our main takeaway today, and this is the main point of our message. Jesus is challenging you and me to walk the entirety of this life trusting in him. All other roads lead to destruction and death, so cling to the hard path that leads to joy and life. I'll say that one more time because that's really long. Jesus is challenging you and me to walk the entirety of this life trusting in him. All other roads lead to destruction and death, so cling to the hard path that leads to joy in life. Imagine a teacher giving you a pop quiz with one question. She said, you can choose question A, it's discussion, or you can choose question B. It's a one answer. Option A will lead you to pass, will lead you to a 100. Option B will lead you to fail. Now that doesn't sound like a hard quiz, but actually it it would depend on the teacher and if you trust the teacher, because I have a lot of teachers in the past that I'd be a little shady about whether or not I could trust what she was saying. But if the teacher trusted my, excuse me, if the teacher wanted 
the best for my well-being, she would let me know that right answer. And that's what we have here. We have Jesus, a good teacher that wants the best for us. So today, Jesus is going to give us three commands that draw us to him and leads us away from the path of destruction that we may have life with him. And the first is this. Jesus calls us into the narrow gate, not the easy one. We see this is in verses 13 and 14. And so the beauty about this sermon Jesus is giving is not just for the people that were sitting in the audience there. Jesus was just as much talking to you and me today than he was this Jewish audience around him. And I want to say that you and I, we can actually understand everything so much better than what these people hearing this sermon for the first time. Because think about it. We live in a Christian subculture. We know the story. We know that Jesus came and lived this perfect life, died the death that we deserve, and was raised to life by the Holy Spirit. But this Jewish audience who are hearing him for the first time, they know he has elegant words. They're just trying to figure out who this man actually is. See John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? Is he a prophet from old? So imagine with me right now, you you have every benefit of of seeing this message on the other side. And so imagine with me right now, Jesus is seeing everyone in this crowd, but he's not just seeing everyone in this crowd, but he's also seeing past his present audience. And he's staring at me and he's staring at you watching behind a screen right now. And then we find in here something we've never seen before. To conclude his sermon, Jesus essentially draws a line in the sand and says, here is life or here is death. And so we can't simply go on with our day thinking about this sermon, thinking, hmm, Jesus had pretty good content, but I wish there was more jokes in his sermon. That's, that's not what it does. It shouldn't lead us to be indifferent when we hear these words. No, we are left thinking, I'm going to leave everything behind to follow him because he is right Or he's wrong, he's a lunatic, he's crazy, and a heretic worthy of death. Those are the decisions that we must draw from this sermon. And we can't just put him in the good teacher box because a mere teacher doesn't make these claims. These words demand us to act. This teacher is saying it is him and it is only him. Acts 4.12 tells us there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved other than Christ Jesus himself. And so what I want to ask you today in all sincerity is that have you come to this conclusion for yourself? Are you trusting in Christ with the entirety of your life, the entirety of it, not just some facets of your life, but the entirety of your life is driven to making Christ known and enjoying him? What is holding you? What makes you wander to a broad path that leads you to destruction? You know, what's really ironic is uh, I wasn't a Christian for 18 years of my life. Uh, And and before I became a believer, when a pastor would ask something like this, uh, ironically, my mind would always jump to someone else and and not me. I I would be thinking the whole time, who needs to be hearing this right now? Who's my non-believing friend that needs to hear this message? And I'm saying, don't worry about Billy over there, but worry about your own heart in this instance. Evaluate yourself. Focus on your heart. See what Jesus is preaching to you right this moment. Because my hope today is that the Lord will use this time to blow up maybe one college student's plans so he won't perish. I hope that the Lord will use his own words today to totally wreck a person who is watching this on a screen that's been a member of our church for maybe 20 to 40 years who's never fully understood the gospel and it finally clicked for them. That is my prayer and that is my hope that we can be honest with ourselves. So let me ask you, what are you living this life for? Or what will you live the rest of your life for? Because if it is for yourself, if it's just to be right and burn all relationships, if it's just to have fun, if, if it's going to just ensure that your child has a happy life all the time by the world's standards, if it's just one of those things that you are living your life for, you are on a path of destruction. For our college students that are going to be here Sunday morning, they're, they're going to hear it their whole lives that to build a name for themselves, they need to work hard. College is to establish time for yourself. Your success is defined by your power, your wealth, and your influence. 
But I want to raise a generation of college students who break that mold and follow a narrow gate life. Because the narrow gate life, it stops us in our tracks and it says, no, I am not called to live for myself. I'm called to deny myself. I'm called to give generous, generously with my money and my time and my efforts. And I'm called to be dependent on someone else entirely other than myself. Therefore, it must contradict everything the world is telling me. And this, this is why the narrow is hard. Because it makes me someone who my flesh doesn't want me to be. So who makes up this broad path? Who makes up the broad path of destruction? Who is walking there right now? I think it's easy for us. We can reason that, well, the irreligious people, they're, they're on that path. People who aren't associated with Christians, who, who make up their own sense of morality and, and consider Christian principles obsolete. I think that's, that's an easy one for our older generation here at the church to consider. Uh, that, that's a no-brainer. But let me tell you right now, people who are under the age of 25, uh, I, I've actually missed this myself. It, it's the generation below me are under immense pressure to conform to beliefs because the majority secular world view wants to devour them for not agreeing with them. And so that's, that's a rant for another day. But so college and uh, college age and youth, don't, don't lean with the culture just because the majority is pressuring you. Take a step back. See what Scripture actually says about an issue and go from there. But it's not just the irreligious that are going down this path. Because it's, it's not just those who openly oppose God. Uh, what's scary about the broad gate is that Jesus says, the majority are on this path. So it's not just uh, the Disney villains with eye patches. It's not just the politician that you really can't stand or, or the anchors on a news political room that you don't like. It's, it's actually people that we know well. It's, it's regular attenders at church. It's, it's the self-righteous who have never spent any legal trouble, any day in legal trouble. It's someone who could admire the morals of the Sermon on the Mount. It's your neighbors. It's people that you see every day that seem like morally good people that are going down a broad path to a broad gate. The narrow gate is hard because when Jesus talks about our purpose being salt and light, it means that I'm meant to put on the character of God on display for the rest of the world to see. And if that's not my driving force, and that's not what's waking me up in the morning, then I'm missing my purpose. To put it in context, God has strategically placed you wherever you are in the city of Troy, in the neighborhood you are, to make his glory known. For our college students, that is on campus, in your classroom, under teachers, in fraternities, sororities, bands, and athletics. And here's what the Broadgate wants you to do. The Broadgate would want you to make yourself known during that time and your organization known. But the narrow gate cries out for you to use that platform to get the gospel to people around you. The broad gate would be to come here for years with mere affiliation and no heart change, no desire to be active for the kingdom. So we have a lot to contemplate. We have a lot of people with different backgrounds, different ideologies, different political affiliations that are running down a broad gate. So what Jesus has said here is that uh, the world applauds multiple paths and well-informed opinions, but when it comes to me, there is no middle road. And so he deserves more than us just seeing these as words, more, as, more than us just seeing these as good morals and ethics, like a buffet line that we can choose and pick that works best for us. And that leads to our second point. Jesus reveals our actions and words mean nothing if they don't match the heart. So imagine if a man goes to the doctor because his head really hurts. This is a made-up situation. Don't think it's a brother I know in person. Um, but for the sake of the analogy, uh, a man goes to the doctor. His head is in extreme pain. The doctor just looks at him, says, doesn't really examine him very well, and says, you have allergies. Take these and you'll be fine in a week. Well, that doesn't sound all that bad. I'm, I'm going to take those pills and I'm going to get better. Well, after a week, he's even in more pain. So he goes to another doctor, describes his symptoms, and the doctor says, 
That, that's, that doesn't sound like allergies to me at all. We need to get you an MRI immediately. And what they find on the MRI is a brain tumor that they have to operate on now. Because if not, it's going to kill him. So you have allergies. A doctor that says that, that is surface level. That is taking a pill. Then the other doctor pointed to something that was so much more severe. And the road would be so much difficult, so much more difficult to recover from. His words were harder to hear, but which doctor pointed us towards life and actual healing? The one that was right, even if his words were hard to hear. And so sometimes love looks more like hard news than it does passivity to avoid conflict. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing for us here, bringing us tough news, which is ultimately the most loving thing he can do or say to us in the moment. When he says the heart of the problem isn't you just doing bad things, it's not just circumstantial things, the heart of the problem is actually your heart. We need new hearts before we can do anything of good. It's way more than words. It's way more than our gifts. And it's way more than just surface level change. It's, it's a love that comes from Jesus supernaturally. And that's why he's warning us here about false prophets in verse 15. These are men that would probably have great words, great influence, had all the gifts in the world. And what's interesting about this text and something I've never even really noticed here is that He's not even saying that these false teachers are saying wrong things. He is simply saying their hearts don't match what they're saying. And so he says, how do you even, how do you even know if they're true prophets? So you need to look at their heart. You, you need to look at the fruit that they are producing in their life. And so that usually surfaces in, in how a, a false teacher runs a church or how he actually just lives his life. And sometimes that can even show up in their teaching. Pastor John MacArthur says, no one is going to openly sell hell to you. No one says, join our group and that leads you to destruction and death. No, and that's, that's what makes this dangerous is because these men are wolves. And maybe not even knowingly. Most people have good intentions that still can rob you away from the goodness that is the gospel. And so I think what Jesus is trying to communicate here is discern what is good and what is evil. I tell college students all the time that fine men, fine pastors, and fine churches who love the Lord genuinely and preach the Bible. Don't go where you hear a a half pep talk and how awesome you are every week, but go somewhere and get plugged into a place that is going to challenge you to grow in your faith and love the Lord your God. Because it is so easy to get spiritual in Troy, Alabama and not actually know the Lord. Verses 21 through 23 should be some of the scariest words for religious people. You're telling me that I can do all these things? I can be in church every Sunday and I can still go to hell? So hear this warning, how we talk about God, especially around others, isn't the best indicator of whether we are following Jesus. And because we live in the Bible Belt, we place this really high value on words and who can articulate and who is gifted in talking about Christianity. That's why we have so many celebrity pastors, which I think is a contradiction in itself. But the danger is that we we learn words about the Christian life and we memorize them, but we never really experience any intimate walk with Jesus because we're just regurgitating what other people are saying. And that is, that is my fear with cultural Christianity, and that is my fear of being in the Bible Belt. Because you can know a whole lot about something, but actually not know anything about it. And then in verse 21 through 23, you, you get these big name guys with these good Christian resumes. The ones that we would call, these are solid guys their whole life. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. I think we'd all be shocked standing there. If we saw this play out, well, I've, I've seen these guys do things. I've seen these guys say things. I, I, I would be looking over Jesus' shoulder thinking, did you read that right? Did you not read through their resume? And then they're panicking too. They're, they're, they're quoting, didn't we do this for you? Didn't we do that? And it's sad because it's almost as if Jesus is telling us, your mighty works aren't proof that you are mine. The fruits of the Spirit which stem from the heart 
prove that you're mine. Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, if I can speak in tongues of angels, if I have all kinds of prophetic powers, if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't love, I'm nothing. I can do a lot of good things in this life and yet not know my Creator, not know my Father, and not know my Savior. The kingdom doesn't work like everything else in this world. It doesn't look for influencers. It doesn't look for the most spiritually gifted. It finds the most needy and the most desperate to make Christ shine even greater. The life of the kingdom is a whole lot more beautiful than we could ever imagine or ever plan for it ourselves. He uses ordinary people to make Jesus great. It's the woman who spends hours at night praying in a prayer closet. And God answers her prayers and he moves. It's the person who has an unimaginable loss of a loved one. Who comes to Christ with a tear-stained Bible in which God gives them infinitely more than they lost. It is one who has some kind of egregious thing done to them by a spouse, a close friend, or a family member. Through that devastating sin, bitterness and resentment came knocking at their door. But following Jesus meant over time they opened that door and ran bitterness and resentment out and opened up with mercy and forgiveness. Jesus looks at people like this and says, I can see your love for me. I can see your heart is after mine. This leads us to our third point. Jesus tells us to build our lives on him. Jesus tells us to build our lives on him. We find this in verses 24 through 26. So Jesus closes his sermon with an infamous parable. He loves doing this. It's one of the main uh, characteristics of Jesus' teaching is his parables. And uh, my, my fear, though, is when we hear sermons like this, we, we oftentimes, we can be so overwhelmed by our sin in the past, or maybe we feel so much pressure about what we should do in the future that we stay frozen in the present. We don't know what we just heard. We don't know what to do with what we just heard. But Jesus is saying to you and me today, come closer today. Come to me today. Where are you withholding your surrender in your heart? Where are you covering your heart? Come closer. Where are you treating heart problems with surface solutions? Come closer to me. Why is he saying that? Because he is right now drawing you to him. Jesus isn't far off. He's not trying to play riddles to get you confused, but he is gentle and he is humble and he is loving. So come to him. You don't have to have everything figured out to come to Jesus. And so today is not about your past. And for us to have a future, we need to start building off this firm foundation, which is in Christ. It is more work for you to build a house on the rock than it will be to build a house on the sand. But it's way less about the work to be done when we know a hurricane is coming. The world is going to try to devour you. It doesn't matter if you are a believer or not. It will suck you in and it will spit you out. Whether you are a Christian or not, you will hit trials and pains and darkness will hit you. And Jesus is here to say, hold on to me. Hold on to my foundation. I have bought you with a price that you may live. That price has been paid already for you. It, it, it has cost something to a good God. So don't run from a foundation that was paid for. An old German pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which disciples leave their nets and follow him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift with which must be asked for, the door at which must a man knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it 
cost God the life of his son. So you were bought at a price. And what God, excuse me, what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not consider his son too dear a price to pay for our lives, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is Jesus coming in the flesh. Without costly grace, we are left in the beach of sand with a huge storm coming with nothing to hold on to. But costly grace lets us build a foundation on Christ who has paid everything in full. You can wither the storms if you are on the solid rock. So what does that look like for you today? What steps will you make towards the kingdom? Because Jesus is gentle and he is accessible to us. He doesn't come here with wanting you to have it all figured out, but he wants you to take it day by day to take steps towards his kingdom. What steps will you make? For some of you, maybe it's just to repent and believe the gospel for the very first time. For some of you, it may be just watching a service on, of church and thinking, I, I need the local body in my life. I need to become a member of the local church. And for some of you, maybe it's for the first time just wanting more than just sitting here on Sundays, being the hands and feet of the kingdom. I pray that you will wrestle with that. I pray that you won't just disregard what Jesus has said to us because it is a matter of life and death. Out of the heart of Jesus, let your heart move. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a good and gracious God. I thank you that you don't sugarcoat things for us, that you make things aware that we need to respond to well. God, I pray that we will just let go of, of, of trying for our own and trust in what you have already done for us, Father. That allows us freedom to work underneath you, covered in your righteousness. We can't fulfill the law perfectly, but you've done that for us. And it, God, let us, let us be a people that, that build on the foundation that you've already set in place. Let us not build in the sands and let us not perish. We love you. You're a good father. In your son's name, amen.
close our service this morning, let me say how excited I am about the restart of Sunday School uh, next Sunday, which does include uh, our preschool and nursery, so we're very excited about that time and look forward to seeing so many of you there. So as we close this morning, I can't help but think about our college students and our college ministry over the past few years, and also for our current students that are attending worship this morning and the questions of who might God be leading to become members here at First Baptist and to serve Christ and his church? Who might God be calling into leadership positions in our college ministry? And who might God be calling into full-time ministry as pastors, ministers, and missionaries? And who might God be calling among our adults to serve and become involved in our college ministry because we actually have former students in all of these categories. So church, let's pray for our students and the impact that we might have on them and also on the kingdom of Christ. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time together this morning. Father, I thank you for Grant and his ministry among our college students. And Father, I would pray that we would see the impact that we can have on these students as they are here on our campus and in our church. Father, thank you that you have called so many of them to remain right here and be vital members of this church, serving in so many capacities. Thank you for those that are serving in ministry around our state and around this country. And thank you for those that are full-time missionaries. And Father, we thank you that we have had a hand in pouring life and pouring Christ into these students. And I would pray for those in attendance today that you would move them and that you would help them to be involved, yes, in this church, but Father, to find a church home and to find their place in ministry. So thank you for these opportunities today. Father, just bless us during this week. Bless us as uh, we share the gospel with others in word and in deed. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.